Yes, on speed. Uh, speeding. All right, Valerie Jackson, take one marker. Valerie, thank you. Absolutely. First question, you know, no one's going to get my question, so incorporate part of my question to answer. Tell us about the first time you set eyes on Mayor Jackson. Oh, my God. <laughs> First time I set eyes on those beautiful eyes of his, um, August 26th, 1976, at Roberta Flack's house. Um, she was having a party for Quincy Jones and, and Maynard, and a good friend of mine was dating Roberta at the time, and he called me and said, Roberta said, come on over Sunday because um, she's having Quincy and Maynard over and she wants you to come. And so I said, oh, really? And he says, yes. He says, Valerie, you ought to come because Maynard Jackson is the kind of man that you need and you're the kind of woman he needs. And I'm looking at him like, what? I said, isn't he married? And my friend said, oh, no, not anymore. I think his divorce had been final about three months. At any rate, I said, well, and he says, oh, come on, Valerie, Quincy will be there. I said, in that case, okay. And so to this day, Quincy claims that if it hadn't been for him, I might not have even have met Maynard. So I'll give credit to Quincy where, where it's due. But I met him at Roberta's. When I walked in, he was sitting over in, in the living room area and um, kind of like holding court because everyone was kind of around him listening to what he was saying. He was very handsome and obviously was uh, garnering the attention of everyone in the room. And so um, I didn't want to, to be or to appear to be a groupie, even though I, I had been impressed with what I had read about him. But I decided to just go on back to the kitchen and maybe talk to Roberta and Quincy while she fried her chicken and waffles. Well, he came back to the kitchen and we started a conversation and it was like everything clicked. Um, it, there was magic there, if, if you want to call it that. But there was definitely an obvious interest on both sides. And so he asked me for my number, and I gave him my business card. I was with Gray Advertising in New York at the time. I said, I'll let him earn the home number, right? He'll have to work up on that one. But as a matter of fact, he called me two days later, and when I got the message, it said, Mr. Jackson called. And I'm like, Jackson, Jackson, I don't know any reps by the name of Jackson, because I'm thinking it's an advertising rep. And then I noticed the area code 404, and I said, oh, sookie, sookie. <laughs> and uh, I called him back, and that was the beginning of a strong, wonderful, interesting um, empowering relationship. Tell us about the courtship. Ah. Uh, lose the pen? Okay, if I lift her hand, I might have it in my hand. Okay. I suspect Maynard might have been one of those last Southern gentlemen um, who literally um, not only read poetry, but recited it, learned it by heart. One of his favorite was Shakespeare's uh, Sonnet 22. Um, and the first time he read that to me, or he recited it to me, I was very impressed, because even though I had men to write um, poems for me before, I never had one recite a Shakespearean poem by heart to me before. So um, he would do things like that, uh, send me flowers. Um, we would take rides on the Ferris, um, the Staten Island Ferry. And as a matter of fact, there was a very telling moment uh, on that ferry because we had been dating a few months. And he, he, no one had said the L word yet. No one had said, I love you, or could this be love? But we were standing on the Staten Island Ferry, and just the two of us talking. It was an overcast day, not a lot of people on the boat. And we were just looking at each other and talking sweet things. And all of a sudden, we heard a whistle. Ooh, and we'd look up, and there's this huge white ship literally crossing the path of the ferry. And it was so close, we literally jumped back because it was such a shock. This white, spotless ship 
not one speck of dirt. That's the one thing I noticed about it. My God, it's so clean, you know. And as the ship passed in front of us, we both noticed the name of the ship, and it was the USS Valerie. I looked at Maynard, and I said, I don't know if you believe in signs or not, but if I were you, I'd say that your ship has come in, and her name is Valerie. Well, he was like, oh, he kept looking at the ship and looking at me and looking at the ship. He says, did you plan this? And I said, what are you talking about? How could I have planned this? He says, well, you're in, in marketing and advertising, and you all do that kind of thing. And I said, well, he says, oh, come on, did you, did you plan this? And so the famous line that year in advertising was, Clairol's only my hairdresser knows for sure. And he looked at me and says, did you plan this? Are you a witch? And I looked at him and I said, only my hairdresser knows for sure. So that's my favorite story. <laughs> <laughs> How long after you and Maynard were courting did he ask you for his, your, hand, his hand, your hand in marriage? I think we had been dating about six months, seven months. Um, I had, I think we had, I think we had been dating about six or seven months when he asked me to marry him. And it was at midnight, May 31st, standing in the kitchen, of all places. That seems very apropos. <laughs> the kitchen in Atlanta, in his, at his place. And um, he asked me if I would marry him. And, I, and he said, but before you answer, I need to call your father. I said, here you are talking to a single professional woman who's been out of her home for 10 years, and you're going to call my father and ask for my hand in marriage, but I loved it. And he called him, and my father was so taken aback, he said, well, uh, if that's what Valerie wants, <laughs> bless his heart. <laughs> well, I was just saying to you, I was watching some footage that uh, Wendy and, and Buddy sent me, some archival footage of your wedding. That must have been very little footage because it was very private in Richmond. Yeah, a few, yeah, well, a few, a few newspaper people got in there somehow or another. I think my brother did it. He's he was a councilman in Richmond at the time, and I suspect he uh, alerted the the media. But um, because when we came out of his home, we saw the press outside. But I was married. Uh, we were married in my brother's home in Richmond, Virginia. Very small wedding, just the immediate family. Very few friends, even. And was it a few days after, his, after he had been elected? Three days after he had been elected to his second term. And during the election, or the campaign, we were very careful, or he was very careful anyway, to try not to let the media get too much into our relationship. I need some water. Excuse me. I, I got it, I got it. I got it. <laughs> While we were dating during the campaign, Maynard was very careful that there was not a lot of publicity about us dating. And it was not that he was trying to keep it a secret or anything, but it was because he was um, afraid that some people might think it was um, done for politics, done for political reasons, that you know every you know, mayor should have a wife and you know the whole thing. And he didn't want it to become an issue in the campaign. So we kept it very quiet and under the radar until after the election. And then we uh, got married and uh, went to France. He combined a business trip with our honeymoon. And so we took care of some business uh, on the honeymoon and uh, went to Toulouse uh, also, which was where his mother and father had been married. Um, when his father was afraid that his mother was not going to come back to Atlanta, he bought a car, drove to New York, took a ship to France, went down to Toulouse, and took her into City Hall in Toulouse and married her on the spot. Uh, Maynard did a similar thing to me. Uh, we were visiting Toulouse in 1993, exactly 60 years after his mother and father had been married. And um, we were passing City Hall, and I looked at him and I said, Maynard, you know what? We ought to get married again. And he said, you know what? I think you're right. 
and he got on the phone and arranged it and that night the mayor of Toulouse married us in the same room that his mother and father had been married in by the mayor of Toulouse exactly 60 years before. That's wonderful. Oh, and then it continues because then my daughter Valerie Amanda, when she became engaged, her fiance asked me, well, before, no, let me back up. She didn't become engaged. Actually, it goes on to my daughter, Valerie Amanda, whose boyfriend asked me if I could help him arrange to visit City Hall in Toulouse, and there he wanted to ask her to marry him in the same room that, his, that her parents had been married in and that her grandparents had been married in. So we have three generations of Jacksons who have been professed or profess their love in City Hall uh, in Toulouse, and um, we'll probably have a grandchild go there and, and, and do it too. Romantic. <laughs> <laughs> Very romantic. So here you're married to Mayor Jackson, who's just finished his first term as the mayor of Atlanta, now he's in his second term as mayor. Uh, some people said that was a tumultuous time. You, you were there yes. when he was dealing with people like Reggie. Yes. Scandal yes. And the child murders. What yeah. kind of pressure did man would have to deal with that you saw it he had to confront every day? Every day, Maynard confronted pressure. Um, and as you know, we were married uh, right after he was reelected, and so I was basically baptized by fire when we came back home, and um, he had to face the music again. But it was tough, but at the same time, it was manageable for him. Um, the, the, the murdered and missing children certainly um, was a hard blow to his heart, especially given that he had a son in the same age range. Um, but he was very careful to go and visit every one of those parents, whether it was 2 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock at night, if he heard of something or a young child missing, he went to see that family. And it was also tough because things were changing in the 90s. Uh, change, let me scratch that, sorry. Yeah, I, I, have to, I get the, the years mixed up sometimes. Uh, we're talking about still 88. Yeah, right. a classic picture of with the reward money. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Missing and murdered kids. And what else was happening there? The Reggie Eves. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, I got it, got it. So, he not only visited each parent or each home, he thought that we needed to do something dramatic that would really bring uh, national attention to this issue so that we couldn't get uh, FBI help and any other kind of help that we might need. And so there's a picture of him um, on a desk in City Hall with $100,000 spread out in a big suitcase that he was offering for a reward or as a reward, that the city of Atlanta was offering as a reward. Um, when there was a bombing in one of the uh, public housing areas, uh, during that time, there was a lot of fear that maybe this was, um, a, you know, a conspiracy, Ku Klux Klan, what? I mean, everybody was on pins and needles. So Maynard made sure that he went out to that uh, public housing area where there was, uh, a, basically it was a boiler that had exploded, but we didn't know it at the time. Um, and then, of course, he had to face uh, the Reggie Eves uh, situation where the police, uh, several policemen were accused of cheating. And that was, I think, one of Maynard's lowest points, I believe, in his administration because Reggie had said that he was going to resign. And Maynard stood up in front of the camera for 40 minutes talking, waiting for Reggie to come in to resign. Reggie didn't show up. So basically, Maynard was standing there with the egg on his face. He was so upset. He was angry at Reggie. He was angry at himself. <sighs> but that passed too. And Reggie came in the next day and did resign. But 
The interesting was that Maynard's battles were not always about the exchange of power, white versus black. Oftentimes, he had to deal with his own people in terms of trying to level their over-exaggerated expectations of him as a mayor, but specifically as a black mayor, because now he's supposed to do everything that we needed for black people, you know. Right. And his point was that, yes, I want to bring more people to the table, this table of inclusion. I'm trying to bring more people to the table, but I can't exclude those who are already at the table. We've got to be sure that we still include those who are already included, in addition to the ones that we are now bringing in. He was a mayor of the whole city, right? <clears throat> he was a mayor of the whole city. That's a struggle. I mean, we've seen that with Obama having a struggle. With as a matter of fact, as I watched Obama, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, when I watched Obama's campaign and his uh, going into office and his first four years, it reminded me so much of Maynard's journey. And I said to myself, Maynard was Obama before Obama was Obama, you know? And so he, he took it in stride. And we used to have a saying between the two of us, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Yeah, it was interesting. I was talking to someone earlier, and they were saying that you know when he was vice mayor, he had supported the sanitation workers. When he was mayor, and the sanitation workers, he fired a lot of them. And so that's that, dude, that dynamic that changed. It it does change when when circumstances change. Reactions change, and yes, he did support the sanitation workers when he was vice mayor, but it was a different, a slightly different kind of situation. When he became mayor and they brought their demands forth, he tried, but there was just absolutely nowhere he could get the money from to meet this raise that they were demanding. And he tried to explain that and to show them with the numbers and everything how it was just not possible. But... Um, <clears throat> But they decided that they wanted to strike. And he warned them, if you strike, you're going to lose your job. And I guess some of them didn't believe him because they did strike. And so he did fire those who, who, who were striking. But he rehired most of them once they had made the commitment to work you know, uh, again. So it wasn't like he just fired them and forgot about them. You know, most of them did come back, were rehired. Um, and so it's, it was always a juggle, always a juggling act. I think I might have asked you this before. Do you think he was, I mean, and Reggie and Eason have been college uh -huh. classmates, uh -huh. they were friends, and they had to deal with him with this old police <coughs> issue. Do you think that throughout his career as a mayor, as a man who was passionate about his commitment to the city of Atlanta, he could have been too loyal to some people? Oh, absolutely. I think one of Maynard's faults was that he was almost loyal. Scratch, sorry. One of Maynard's problems was that he was almost loyal to a fault, which was part of what happened with Reggie Eves. This was his friend, his college roommate, had, who had stood by him and uh, gotten the police in order and so forth, and so. Loyalty was what friends did. They gave each other loyalty until you were proven not deserving of it. But he was trying to be so loyal to Reggie that in fact he basically, like I said, ended up with egg on his face. Uh, he demanded loyalty sometimes too much, I believe. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of one, yeah. Um, sometimes when there were situations when the council didn't agree with the mayor's office or whatnot, um, if there had been um, a council person on staff that had basically been, I'm not going to say his, his uh, floor leader, but who had been um, supportive of him, 
And so he was very supportive of that person. But then if that, you know what, let's scratch this. This is not working. I, I'm, I can't come up with the, the example I'm looking for. Maybe before it's over with. Okay. As mayor, and now you're the first lady of the city, how do you negotiate being both a husband, a father, and a politician? How did Maynard negotiate being husband, father, and politician? Well, <clears throat> we had a lot of rules. <laughs> rules, okay. First rule, um, well, good rules. Unless there was an emergency somewhere or a major meeting, Maynard was home at 6.30 to sit at the dinner table with us without fail. We would sing the blessing. We all had nice voices. And one of the things that I really miss most about the family and about Maynard not being here is when we would sing the grace at dinner. It was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. So dinner at 6.30. Um, Sundays were for family. No business meetings unless it was an emergency. Sunday was family day, church drive around the city looking for potholes. <laughs> um, he often talked with me about his businesses, about his problems, his issues. I was like a sounding board. And so because I was in a way a little bit of a part of it, it wasn't like, you know, he cut me off and, you know, it was just business and then it was home. It's, they all had a way of melding together. Um, and so he was, he had to be demanding, which I think was necessary to do as much as he wanted or as much as he was trying to get done. And he demanded excellence. Now, excellence doesn't always mean that you have to have everything perfectly right, because there's no such thing as perfection. But excellence is something that you can strive for and that you can uh, require uh, from people. And so when his, I'm sure you've heard the stories about his people that worked with him at City Hall and would take, bring him a report and he'd give it back with, you know, 17 red letters and errors and corrections and so forth. So, but that was good. It made us thorough. It made us think, critical thinking. And we even, even you know, with the young kids, with I had two daughters, if they wanted to take a school trip or do something that was not actually part of the curriculum, they had to come with us, come to us with their plan. What is it that they wanted? Why did they want it? Why should they have it? Would the cost be affordable? Who's going to be responsible at the school? I mean, all these things they had to get together and bring to us and present if they wanted to take a trip. Well, Dad, this is what it is. Boom, boom. But he taught them to bring information, do your homework. One of his biggest lines that I teach at the Maynard Jackson Youth Foundation that we teach at the Maynard Jackson High School is do your homework. A leader does his homework. Well, Alexandra had her act together because she knew she should come to me first. <laughs> get my approval, and then she could go to her daddy, and then come back to me. Because I was not very, really enthusiastic about it at first either, because I was concerned. I'm like, boys, I mean, all these hard-headed, even though she was a very strong young girl, she was still going to be hanging out with a bunch of boys. And um, so I said to her, I'm not sure, sweetheart. I said, and she said, well, the coach said it's okay. And I said, well, I'm not. She says, mom. She said, how can you tell me that I can't be the first girl to play on Lovett's football team? You were the first woman to do this, and you were the first girl to do this, and you're first in your family to do that, and, that, that, that. and now you're not going to let me be the first girl to play on Lovett's football team? What could I say, right? So I said, well, if your daddy doesn't have any problem with it, all right. And she goes to Maynard, and you know her, but he said, absolutely not. You might get hurt and not be able to have any children. I was like, oh, Maynard. Would you tell your son that? No, you can't play football because you might get hurt and not have, not be able to have children. So I took him to the explaining room. 
<laughs> and I sat him down and said, Maynard, we have got to let her try this. You've taught, you know, us to be strong and to go, at the, the whole thing that, you know, that I'm sure she explained to you. And uh, after he thought about it, he realized, no, uh, you know, I, you're right, I've, I've got to let her try this. And so he changed his mind and came on out and gave her his blessings. She says he was tackle. Oh yeah, she was a tackle. She was not a kicker. You know, no kickers. <laughs> she was a real football player. Uh -huh. Yeah. When Maynard decided to run for that third term, hmm. what, what was the conversation you had with him and he had with you about that running for the third term? To go back into office yeah, after he had been out yeah. for eight years. <laughs> what did you say to him about Are you kidding? No, not really. <laughs> Maybe I did say, are you kidding? Um, I said, really? And um, I th I, he looked at me, and I think he thought I was probably thinking about all the money that we were going to be losing uh, in terms of his giving up his, you know, successful law practice. I mean, the Chapman and Cutler and so forth, and he would have to take a tremendous, tremendous cut in pay. And we had children that we were trying to get through school and college upcoming and so forth. So, but I really didn't think about all that initially um, because I wasn't surprised that he said that he wanted to run again. And so I listened to him in terms of why he felt that he had to do it when he felt that he wanted to guarantee some things that he and Andy had set in motion he wanted to protect not just, you know, what Andy had done, but what he had done before Andy. And he, he knew that he had the kind of commitment that would make sure that those things, you know, were carried on. Um, and I think he thought that there were still some things that needed to be done in the city, that we could have done some better jobs in our neighborhoods, the neighborhood planning units. Um, <clears throat> when um, when we tore down some uh, neighborhoods to build um, facilities for football or whatever, and those neighborhoods weren't those neighborhoods weren't really uh, <clears throat> rewarded in return. So he wanted to go back and fix some things like that, and um, and also because. He, he comes from that long line of ministers. Grandfather, father, uncles, just about every man in his Jackson family was a minister at some point. And he told me, he says, you know, Valerie, I really haven't heard a calling per se, but I've definitely heard a whisper. And so he says, it's going to be your choice. I either will go back into politics or I'll go into the ministry but I have got to serve. I've got to serve the masses. And so I told him, I think you ought to go back into politics. Unfortunately, but I knew that that's where his heart was, that he really needed to be a servant leader. And so, um, I told him, sweetheart, we'll make it work. You know, I'll work more. You know, we'll make it work somehow. And um, you can go back and do what you really love doing. What, when he became mayor for their third term, Atlanta was a different city. Mm -hmm. It was the 90s, and like other major American cities, they were dealing with issues of <coughs> Well, <clears throat> it was difficult because, as you mentioned, the dynamics uh, in the 90s uh, started to change. Um, infusion of drugs, crack, um, 
just um, the results of a uh, recession. So, and we couldn't get the money out of Washington that we used to be able to get. You know, we couldn't get it from the state that we used to be able to get. It was almost an anti-Atlanta thing in the state capital where, you know, they really didn't want to give Atlanta any more money. So, less money, more um, distractions in terms of whether it's crime or poverty or housing. Um, and so, he was inundated not only with the old problems that were still there, but for the new ones that were coming in. And actually, it was probably pretty good that Maynard went back in for that third term, because he knew how to kind of correct what might have gone wrong, so to speak. Had the capital, the political capital, to get things done, uh, the white business community you know, we're starting to open their arms up because they saw what a great job he did at the airport in spite of their big um, uh, distractions in terms of uh, not wanting to do the joint ventures. But the bottom line was he didn't just make, you know, as, as the rumor goes, about 20 black millionaires. He probably made about 40 white millionaires, <laughs> if not more. You know, So I never could quite understand why they were complaining, you know. <laughs> Oh, another word is greed, at any rate. So, it, but Maynard rolled on, um, but the, the, there were things facing him also in that third term, uh, like the five children who were still in schools, you know, some in, in elementary, junior, and college, and he had to start thinking about that issue also, because the mayor's office was still paying about well, I don't know how much, but less than maybe about 80,000, 50 to 80,000, you know? Much less than what he was making. Oh, people. <laughs> so, but um, it was his determination, it was his will. And people talk about his determination. His favorite poem is called Will by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. And um, he's got that strong kind of determination. And that's what gets him through stuff, is that just that. St Strong will. But you were seeing him come home every day, deal with all this. He was also dealing with physical and health issues. Yeah. This must have taken a, a, a psychological, emotional toll on you. I don't really recall it being too much of a toll on me. And I say that because. I loved him deeply. I suffered with him. I, you know, re, I, I celebrated with him. Uh, we were partners. Um, I was concerned about his health. That was my major focus, was to try to keep him healthy, whether it was cooking the right food or being sure that I wake him up in time to go to his workout. Um, but I think the hardest part was watching him lose his joy in governing. And I'm not quite sure to explain how one loses that. But I, I, I guess it has to do with the fact that units that sells in the city aren't doing the parts that they need to do. You know, politics is made up of a bunch of cells, organizations, you know, uh, departments, individuals, and each of us, just like the cells in our body. Every cell in our body has a purpose. And if the cells in our body don't do their job, we get sick. Same with the city. If the cities and the cells in the cities aren't doing the jobs that they're supposed to do, the city is not as healthy as it could be. And I think he felt that some of the cells in the city weren't bringing as much to the city as they should or could. And that um, took a little bit of the joy out. When Maynard decided to 
decided not to run for re-election, <clears throat> what was the conversation he had with you? It was the toughest uh, decision, I think, if not the... When Maynard decided not to run for a fourth term, I think it was really the toughest decision he had ever had to make. Even more so than whether he ran against Herman Talmadge or ran for the vice mayor or ran for the mayor's office. Not running for that fourth term was the most difficult decision I've ever seen him have to make. Because he wanted to do it, especially after they had won the Olympics. After we won the Olympics, he wanted to be there in 96, sitting up there in that box, you know, with Andy and Billy Payne and everybody. And I mean, he still was, but, you know, as mayor, you know, he, he wanted to be able to celebrate it that way. Um, so he was going to lose that, you know, that uh, part of the celebration, so to speak. Um, So not only was, the, was he thinking about the Olympics, but he was also thinking about what he felt he owed the city. Um, and once again, once he makes a commitment, he tries to live through it. And it was basically a health decision, though. Um, he had had a six bypass heart surgery. And the doctor told him, you've got to slow it down, you've got to eat right. Or you know, suffer the consequences. So he decided to listen to the doctor because the doctor didn't think he should run either. I mean, he could have, you know, but, you know. And I, I said to Maynard, I said, Maynard, um, be careful, you, you're old to be having babies. And when you go into, when you become the mayor of a city, you become a father to a lot of, in a, in a sense, babies. And I was saying, man, you're a little bit too old to be having babies, you know. You've, you've already been there and done that. So I supported uh, him in that and thought that he made the right decision not to, to run. Um, and I was glad to see him get a lot of that stuff off of his shoulder, you know, because he deserved some, he deserved some years where he could really just enjoy himself and reap the benefits of all of his hard work. And um, you got to stop working so hard to do that. Right? Yeah, yeah. So how was it for him after that, after he retired? From the he never retired. <laughs> he still got involved in every little vote for, you know, tax, you know, tax uh, dollars for splotch, you know, a sales tax and things like that. Uh, but, but at least he didn't have, you know, the buck didn't come to him. So it was, it was, it was a lot different. But he stayed very active in politics. Of course, everybody wanted his endorsements if they ran for anything. So he had to play his, he had to play his cards fair and right. Um, but he stayed just as busy. And, um, uh, but he was able to work a lot more out of the house. So that made a difference in terms of his physical presence. And that was good. And that's made you feel good. <laughs> yeah, although sometimes I was like, Maynard, don't you need to take a trip? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because he was demanding at home, too. <laughs> well, that's being mayor for a long time. Man and man. <laughs> but this was, but, you know, I guess for him, this was a, this was a better time than when he had <gasps> left the mayor, left, mayor, left being mayor after the second term, where he had a difficult time with getting work and, you know, after that. Yeah. When Maynard left office after his first two terms, there was a lot of talk about how um, he couldn't find a job. Well, first of all, Maynard wasn't looking for a job. Uh, what he did not find was the caliber and the level of involvement that he wanted to do with a firm. Now, some people said, well, you know, he was snubbed and he was, they were punishing him, you know. Well, punishing him for what? making a city great. My, my 
interpretation is not so much that they were punishing Maynard. I think they were still intimidated by Maynard and didn't know what to do with a Maynard Jackson. You've got the most powerful man in the city, one of the most powerful black people in the country, coming into your firm. Where's the sunlight going to go? Where's the attention going to go? I don't think they wanted the competition. It wasn't that they were punishing him. They were trying to save themselves. <laughs> anyway, my daughter told you how, in fact, one of those firms that did snub him, in fact, begged her to work with them later on. That made Maynard feel real good. That made him say, yeah, you didn't want me, but you wanted her even more. <laughs> so that was great. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So take this to that day. Before I do that, I feel like my hair is falling in my eyes. Is am yeah. I? Is it dropping or something? Because I, I, can you? I feel like it's it's not it's not falling in. The, okay, then all right. It's still full. All right then. All right then. Don't worry about it. Then lower it. Okay, I just. Before you do this, ask this question. You get me ready. Get you ready. I'm good, I'm good. I cried the other two, I'll, I'll be able to make it through this one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, everybody settle. Quiet, On Monday morning, June 23rd, Maynard had an early flight out to DC. And so um, we kissed each other farewell as he left to go to the airport. And I said, the last thing I said was him, to, the last thing I said to him was, have a safe trip. And he said, okay. And then about 8.30, I was working in the yard. I, that's one of my pastimes. I was working in the yard, and I got a phone call from Pat Allen about 8.30. And she told me that he had fallen out at the airport in D.C. And that um, they were taking him to the hospital. Well, <clears throat> at that point, he had not passed when I was talking to, to, to Pat. So I was still thinking, well, you know, He's had a heart attack, but we'll get there and you know, everything will be okay. But unfortunately, it wasn't. He didn't make it to the hospital. And when Pat called and told me, actually it was uh, Howie, Beth's husband, Howie, son-in-law, who uh, was in D.C. at the hospital. He called me and he said, Valerie, he didn't make it. And I'll be very honest, I really remember very little after that. I'm not sure if I cried. I, I, I remember I felt numb, maybe. And um, and I just kind of sat at the kitchen table and let people come in and talk to themselves because there was nothing I could say. I mean, I was just still kind of numb. I guess I was in shock. I guess I was in shock. And thank God I had uh, Valerie Amanda there with me and Alexandra and a couple of people from the office, Pat Allen and Ingrid came over and thank God for Ingrid Saunders Jones. And they kind of started the ball rolling for me, and uh, I just kind of stayed back in the bedroom most of the day, numb, and not believing it. I don't think I really reacted until the next day, and that's when I started screaming and yelling, no, no, no. Um, but it was... Um, 
It was a day that I had tried to be ready for because I was a very pragmatic person in terms of I looked at the numbers, I looked at how old he was, what his health history was, you know, and I knew that he probably wouldn't live to be 90. And so I wanted to be sure that every day that I did have with him was going to be a good one. Um, we had a wonderful marriage. It was strong. We did a lot of bickering, but that's because we were strong people, you know, and that's how we discussed and, and argued. Uh, I mean, argued. That's how we discussed um, things. And um, as much as we were romantic, we were also very pragmatic. And so I think one of the reasons I was able to, to move on uh, and to, to, be, to be strong, if I was, because he was, you've heard people say, the wind beneath the wings, being, oh, I'm sorry, now I'm getting emotional again. I think one of the reasons I was able to get through Maynard's death uh, at that point, because I'm still getting through Maynard's death, because more than anything else, I knew that he had been happy in our marriage. One of the gifts that God gave me the weekend just before he passed was a conversation that Maynard and I had that Saturday morning when we were talking about people that had let him down who hadn't been loyal to him and he was angry with someone and I was listening to him complain and, and, and you know, I said to him, Maynard, sweetheart, I said, you know what? You'll never get what you want until you let go of that anger. And he said, you know what, Valerie, you are so right and you take such good care of me. I thank you so much. He said, you are the best thing that's happened to me. God sent you to me. You have been a blessing in my life, and I love you so much. And I said to him, I said, and I love you, Maynard, more than you even know. Neither of us knowing really that those would really be the last, that that would be the time, the last time we would say to each other's face, you know, I love you dearly. So God gave me that gift. I didn't have to look back and say, oh, you know, did I make him happy? Was I a good wife? Did I give him everything he needed? Because he told me I had. He told me I had. And that's something that I guess a lot of people don't get. So I was very, very lucky. That's what probably kept me from freaking out that first day because I had just heard him tell me the night before how much he had loved me. Yeah. The last time we sat down together, you read a poem that made you <laughs> Oh, yeah. Do you have that poem today? Can you read it to me? Oh, I, yes, I'll read it to you. I, I know it by heart, but I'll read it anyway, just in case I get emotional. <laughs> And you know, I want to say this, so he was very romantic, but I want to give the fellows and the ladies out there a little heads up. It just didn't just happen. So fellas, don't feel that he was so, you know, marvelous and so whatever. He had to work at it. I had to teach him some things. I had to drop hints, you know? So I wrote him some poetry too. It was a two-way street. And I think that's what most marriages sometimes, you know, don't get quite straight, that it's a two-way street and you have to feed each other. You have to constantly inspire each other and motivate each other. And so, um, I, you know, for 25th anniversary, he wrote me a poem. And um, it said so much. So I will be happy to share that with you. And I need to probably explain the title before I say it just so you kind of understand that he wasn't writing a dirty poem. Uh, I had a habit when um, 
Maynard would leave the house. I would put lipstick on my lips, put a lip kiss on a tissue, then go to his chest of drawers, open it, lift up a few shirts, and stick that tissue kiss in there. And then if he was traveling, sometimes I'd you know, put a tissue kiss in his bag after he had packed so that when he got to the city that he was going and was unpacking, he'd find one of these tissue kisses. And so this is exactly the way he wrote it, annotations and all. For my wife, Valerie, on our 25th wedding anniversary, October 7, 2002. Kisses in my drawers by Maynard H. Jackson. For 25 years of marriage, you've loved me every way, from flowers in my bathroom to love words every day. You've given me and raised with love two daughters good and rare. Their music, humor, and scholarship are wrapped in hearts that care. You've managed and secured our home and fiscal base, and despite my impatience, you've kept a steady grace. But nothing that you do spurs anticipation quite as much as your kisses in my drawers and their promise of your touch. With lipstick on your lips, you put lip prints on white tissues. You spread them all among my shirts and underwear. So all the drawers I open have reminders of your care. With lipstick on your lips, you put lip prints on white tissues. So even when you travel, your lush lips say you're miss you. So no brief sparks or anger, not even domestic Star Wars can overcome the excitement of your kisses in my drawers. Aches, pains, and creeping age, empty nester though we be, the sonnets from your paper kisses bind my heart to thee. For truly real sweet kisses, paper kisses just substitute. But in the pluses and minuses of life and vowels, both help us to compute. For kisses in my drawers, on paper small and square, my leaping love forevermore, for you I do declare, may not. That's what keeps me going. I read this at least once a month. <laughs> and it's, it's special. I wrote him some poems, too, so, anyway. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, yeah, let me, let me just, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't feel like I gave you anything new, but I think you 